can see, and we can see, you know what? Yeah. This gives us a lot of good information about our pod. We can see the name, we can see the image, we can see the node that it's running on. We can see its status and the replication controllers that are watching over this thing, like little like guardians or something. There's also a really cool event stream, which normally would be really boring, except for the fact that I had that little that little snafu earlier. So in fact, this all worked out perfectly. <laughs> Seriously, I'm just really lucky somebody here had a phone. So, so that's pretty cool. It looks like I have plenty of time left. So, actually, let's do this. QCTL. Yeah, pause. So I got plenty of time left. <laughs> so, like I said, we can label. We can label things. So, we can label things. Um, or actually, let me take a step back. We can we can get the nodes that are running. Like I said, a node is a Kubernetes resource. The cool thing is that we can also describe the node. We can also describe the nodes, and that gives us some pretty cool information. We can see the last time. We can see things like the uh, we see the name of the box. We can see the last time the box said, "Hey, I'm alive," to Kubernetes. We see the we can see the address of the box. We can see the capacity that this thing that this thing can do. Um, some of it is configuration because I really doubt this VM on my box can do 40 pods. But it do, it, it is pretty intelligent about everything else. We can also see cool information like the kernel version and the OS version and the container runtime that's actually being used on these boxes. And trust me, I love Docker but it's not always a bug-free experience. So if you're trying to troubleshoot something that you think may be specific to a version, that's a pretty killer thing. That you can find out in a heartbeat if maybe you need to do some upgrading or something like that. You can also see the pods that are in use on the box itself. Okay, so now we're gonna, so now let's, let's label something. We can use the label Backly keyboard. <laughs> so, I'm, ow, whoa! Yeah, sorry. 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 What is going on? Am I doing that? The Jason room controls the lights I was told earlier. That's the most amazing thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's uh, so let's label so let's label something. Um, so let's label something. Um, let's see, food. What's your favorite food? Since you gave me uh, your phone, curry. Okay. Yeah. Like I said, I can label, like I said, I can label things. So if I do QCTL get nodes, we can see that we now have a favorite food of curry on apparently a node that is decided not to be running. Oh, and there it's back. Welcome back, buddy. Are these labels visible within the guest? Or within the Docker Um so Kubernetes has a concept um, called a service account in which you can communicate back to the API. So you, I would suspect that it would be available through that. Okay. Okay. Um, so here we go. So if we want to do, so if we want to do a selector query, we can do git node dash l. And we can say food curry. And we get the one back. So that's pretty cool. Um, like I said, and this is really helpful if you have say nodes that are in different regions or in different racks inside a particular data center, that's really the information. But say there's a possibility that at some point we really don't want that label anymore. Sorry. We can just throw in the key name, the label key name and a dash and it pops it off. So if I do my search again, I get nothing back. But it's still there. Hopefully working. Okay. So it's a little bit of administrative, but now let's get into some more interesting things. One of the nice things about Docker containers is we can scale, and it's pretty and it's pretty straightforward to scale. In Kubernetes, from kubectl, 
It's incredibly easy. It's incredibly easy to scale using the scale, using the scale verb. And so you see there I have two pods. I'm going to do four replicas. And I'm going to scale up my replication controller named block controller, which was the controller that I created earlier. And I spelled replicas wrong. Spell it right. Yeah, that's the trick. So, so now we've scaled up. We can look at our pods again. We can see that we have two new ones that are seven seconds old instead of seven hours. <laughs> They're up and ready to go. So that's pretty cool. We can, I'm going to scale these back down because I'm going to do a demonstration shortly that's going to take a lot longer if I don't. So, scale back to two, get pods, and there you go, it kept two. That's pretty cool. So, I think, so this is the first time I've never seen it do that, and it's also doing things like telling me I have a seven hour old pod. I think that I'm hitting some sort of weird I think I'm hitting some sort of weirdness because once I had my cluster working, once I was here in Ohio, I didn't mess with it because I felt like that was just dancing with disaster. So to every other time I've seen it do that, every other time I've done this, it's kept the two youngest. I'm not sure that, I'm not going to make the claim that that's what it's supposed to do, but I think this is just some weirdness. So. Not particularly. Um, So Kubernetes itself, to my knowledge, does not provide that. Um, I would suspect... Okay. To your question, um, Kubernetes, doesn't, uh, to my knowledge, doesn't support something like that. You could um, theoretically, you could theoretically do that yourself. Um, one of the one of the things about Kubernetes is that it takes strides to not to do its best not to force an application lifecycle on you if it can if it can if it can if it can get away with it. Um, but the API I would think would be robust enough that you could probably do something like that yourself. Okay. So I am running uh, so I'm running low on time. So let me get through these last few demonstrations and I'll take questions. Um, Okay, so now, so we've got controllers. So let's look at some debugging. Let's look at some debugging stuff that we can do. One of the things that we can do is we can get logs, is that we can get logs for a particular uh, um, pod, similarly to how we would with Docker, similarly to how we would with Docker, uh, Docker logs. So if we do that, that's the, that is the log that's coming back from the container within my, that's coming back from the container within my pod. If I have more than one container, I have to specify the container by name, but for a situation where I have a pod with only one container in it, I can just say, give me the logs for the pod, and then there it is, it gives me that. The other nice thing that you can do is if you've got something funky going on, you can actually follow the logs by slapping a dash, dash F in there. And anything that this thing does, it's gonna follow. There is a current, there is a current bug out there that this times out pretty quickly, so, if you use this, you may you might have to follow a couple times if it disconnects. Um, it's an active GitHub ticket. They're talking about it. Okay. So that's so that's cool. We can also do as we can in Docker. We can actually do exec. We can actually execute things inside the pod and find out information about it. And so here I've ex executed ps inside of one inside of one of my pods. And it shows me my Nginx process, the worker process, and then the fact that I ran PS. 
You can also do inter you can also go in there and interact with it and, and you know do interactive things with it. So here I've opened up a shell. Here's that. I can cd into my web directory. I can type things right. There's my files. So you can do things like that if the situation gets dire and you want to start mucking about inside of the container. So now let's create a service. Now, so now let's create our service. Just looking to see how much time I've got. Okay. So here's our service. It works similar. Um, some things are similar to the replication controller. We've got our metadata, which gives us a block, um, the name and our labels. We have a spec. We have a type there. And what the type is, is by default, services in Kubernetes are only available to other things in Kubernetes. By specifying type node port, Cube, uh, Cube uh, proxy is going to open a port on any box running the Cube, on any node running Cube proxy, and it's going to forward my traffic inside of the, um, it's going to forward my traffic to the proper place inside there. The other type that you can use is load balancer, which if you're, use, if you're running in a, supported, in a supported cloud provider, this will actually create a load balancer for you. It works in Amazon Web Services, it works in uh, Google Cloud Engine, I think it works in Rackspace, and I can't remember any other ones. The port is, the port's there, that's just the port that the container is, the application is serving on inside of the container. And then we have the selector that's the blog pod, so that we know where the traffic needs to go from our service to the pods. So I will do service. Okay, so we see right here, so we see right here that we've, uh, it gives us a warning. We've exposed a port. We've exposed a service on an external port. We probably need to do some firewall stuff. So at this point, I'm going to pop over here and demonstrate that I'm not completely full of it. Oh, that's, no, that's full. Open a new window. And I'm going to open DevTools because Chrome if I don't, Chrome will awesomely cache this page for me and make me a liar. So, okay. So we're going to hit one of our. So we're going to hit one of our uh, one of our nodes running inside of my cluster on that port. Come on. Things are really slow. listening on that one, okay. Okay, so there it is. Um, there's probably something wrong with my node. That was the node that flashed not ready, so I should have known better than to pick that one. So anyway, so here's my net, so here's my, um, so here's my um, blog running inside of Kubernetes, inside of my container. I like to do Go development, so, you know, I don't write much. I'm not a good blogger. My talks page is pretty bad. And I'm here giving a talk now, so I should probably update that. So now I'm going to do the coup de grace, and I'm going to do a rolling update to deploy a new version of my blog and hope that it works. Because the demo has gone swimmingly so far. <laughs> the verb for kubectl to do that is rolling update. I'm going to provide an image. And the image is Quay.io, Kelcecil, Kelcecil, Kong, Fox. And I'm going to specify the controller that I want, the control, the replication controller that I want to update. So, <coughs> what's happening at this point is that Kubernetes, at this exact moment, is creating a new flock, is creating a new controller, and it's spinning up a replica inside of the new replication controller. At the same time, it's spinning down replicas inside of the other inside of the other controller. It's attempting to do this, it's doing this in an attempt to make sure that you that things just stay up and that things are still there and alive and responding. So so if we pop back over here. Yeah. So in the piece that you had a bunch of stuff that basically makes sure that the service is always still serving. So if you yes. a certain percentage of them brings up new Yes. Okay. 
And in fact, you can actually pass in parameters here. That sounded bad. You can actually, you can actually um, pass in parameters to make it take its time. It goes slower to make sure that if you want to be less aggressive about rolling things over, it can take longer. The default here, the default I think is a minute. Um, but that's why I reduced from four to two, or this would be really long. Yeah. So. Can you step through these? Is that an option? You said slow down. Like maybe you step to the first one and says, hey, check here, make sure it works. Or so Kubernetes is going to make a check. It's going to do its typical health check, but Kubernetes is going to make the health check such that um, it's going to make checks to make sure the container is alive. Um, and then it can also do an HTTP check to make sure your application is running. However, as things currently stand, Kubernetes can't, um, you know, won't do a rollback to an old version. However, that is, I believe that's being talked about. So that's something that that's something that people have said we'd like to have that. You know, we would love to see that. Please give it to us. So can you provide your own HTTP check. You, you you can you can config you can configure it within I think the pod specification okay. I think. Cool. So if you see here, a website. Look at that. I still didn't really put anything there, but okay. So, did it finish? It's still finishing on the other node. So, yeah, service with a smile. That node may just be hosed. Yeah. But hey, most of it worked. I think that's probably just weirdness with my. I think that's just weirdness with that particular vagrant, vagrant host. Um, is that one of them that shut down? Huh? Is that one of them that shut down when you... Uh, that was the node that whenever I made the comment that it was popping up as not ready, that was the one that was being a little weird. So I think it's just something where I've been coming in and out of sleep and stuff like that, and I think I've just put it in a bad state. But it works most of the time. So anyway, that is all I have. Um, it is 4.49 now. I think I have probably a couple minutes for questions. Um, and then I'll be here, I will be here um, through the after party if you wanna hang out and talk about Kubernetes, I'd love to talk about it. And I would like to, while I'm up here, I would like to be on a soapbox for a second and say, this is the most exciting time that I think we've been in in a long time for infrastructure and things like that. But the concept of with the concept of containers and unit kernels and things like that, it's an amazing time for us. I want to encourage every person in this room to go out and contribute to this conversation, blog, blog about it, do some, do some pull requests, just play and learn and share what you learn. And if you're looking for a place to contribute open and open source and you want to get started, I personally think you can't do wrong with the Kubernetes community. They're incredibly welcome. They're incredibly helpful, and they're willing, and they're willing to pair with you to help you out to make sure that you can meet your goals. If you want to start in a, in a community, I think Kubernetes is the way to go. But no matter what, what's important to me is that we're all part of this conversation. So, step down off my soapbox. Let's hear some questions. Are the storage backends tied to a certain provider? So, for example, if I was running bare metal Kubernetes in my data center, can I still use GCP storage and AWS? So the question, so the question is, is are the data volumes tied to the provider? Um, so I don't know. So I'm an AWS engineer by day, um, and I guess by night, I don't know. <laughs> the thing about, so the thing in AWS is that you have the concept of IAM roles that provide credentials to your boxes, and so then you don't have to provide configuration. Kubernetes will get that out of that information. You, I would suspect. Disclaimer: I have no idea, but I think. What you could probably do is you could probably provide AWS API keys. Well, actually, no, with an EBS volume, you couldn't do that because they wouldn't let you mount that outside of. So, okay, so let me back up and take the BS out of what I just said. I don't think so. However, what I do think you could probably do is you could probably use some kind of NFS solution that's hosted in AWS with, the, with peering into the cloud to be able to get something like the same thing. Um, so, let me, so let me back that up. Unless the cloud provider would support mounting a volume 
to some external to some external device, it would not. Mm -hmm. But I think you could find a way around it if you were. The other one has three services in terms of the, the SF or yep. other types. So you can run that treatment type of stuff as whether it'll work. That's what you're Yeah, I mean, S3 you can write pretty much as long as you have a proper API key. So that you could do. So it just it depends on the it depends on the server. Questions? Hey. Uh, what about uh, the master server goes down? Is there any kind of failover? Does everything just run as a normal Docker setup? So, so there's okay. So the question I think there were two questions there. Number one, what about high availability in, Do in <coughs> Kubernetes, right? And the second is, can you run it inside a Docker container? The first, the first answer is currently there is um, there's not really a high availability setup, but there were but there's a special interest group working. Um, um, in my in my experience, um, in my experience in AWS, your master going down. It, if your master goes down, if your pods reconnect, it's probably going to wipe out a lot of your containers and come back. Um, and so that's an area that needs work that they're actively working on. The second question is about containers. To my knowledge, I think that the only thing thus far, there was one component that they stuck in a Docker container, but they were dealing with challenges, but they were dealing with challenges around containerizing some of these things. Um, so currently, so currently, I think the best thing to do is to run it um, on bare metal. But again, work in progress. Does that answer the, does that answer your question? Yeah, I guess the main question is just what happens when the master goes down. Um, in my in my experience, if it comes back up, uh, I've seen it wipe out my I've seen it wipe out my containers. Um, I uh, I this was with an older version. I haven't seen what it would do recently, and I know that high availability is in the work because that is a concern. Is there any way you could do like a failover to a server that is running your nodes? A failover the server? Like if you had a, a primary master and maybe you had a backup on the same server that's running all your nodes on. That's um, not currently, but that's part of what's being di uh, discussed and designed. Sir? Are you guys running this in production by any chance? Yes, we are. Um, actually, yes, I would love to tell you about that. So, <laughs> so we've, so in, uh, so Realtor.com Morgantown, we've got uh, two Kubernetes clusters. We have the cluster that I maintain. Um, it was the first cluster that we had in production. Currently, it runs about 400 pods that deal primarily with running processes that syndicate data. Um, the second thing that we have, um, the second cluster that we have, um, is actually, I think, is it Leon? Is it running Deus? Do you know? It's yes. running. Okay. It's a second. It's a secondary data. It's a, it's Deus on top of Kubernetes, and it's um, tasked with the infrastructure. For example, um, it. it Hosts are uh, Kibana, Grafana set up. It does. Um, yeah, we put we put a job system in there. Um, well, I didn't. They did. Um, he uh, runs Sensu. Okay, those are Sensu stuff. And so, some examples. But yeah, we have two. One of them powers infrastructure, but then ours is in production. And we're looking at putting more into production. So. Hey, yeah. Not that I know of, but you've asked a very interesting question that I'm going to go Google later. <laughs> so I don't know. That's an, that's interesting. I'm going to Google that later. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry. Okay, um, Kubernetes does bare bones making, how much, okay, I'm gonna, uh, are you the next guy in here? Way back there. Okay, I'll do this one and I'm done. Um, so, so pretty much, um, Kubernetes will do basic checks, like I said, it'll check through the Docker daemon to make sure the container's healthy, and then you can do HTTP checks. We have, um, we have, uh, we have systems in place using Sensu that, monitors in our cluster 
one of the things that they've been really looking at is using Prometheus, which is a Golang, which is a Golang solution that I think does something similar. Um, and they're talking about doing that more, but I think ultimately what it comes down to is if you're going to want to do something yourself to make sure your containers are healthy. Um, and Kubernetes will only do so much for you on that. Contact information. My contact information? Oh, I had that. Um, I had a slide for that. Uh, da, 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 da. So I love getting right there. I love getting email. Follow me on Twitter. I talk about video games, tech stuff, uh, whatever. I love talking to people. That's my website. I blog yearly. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming. I really appreciate it.